Good morning, friends. How's everybody this morning? Everybody's well. Tell you what, I want to take just a minute before we get too terribly uh, busy here this morning and just acknowledge a few things that uh, are we, our church is blessed, and I think we a, large, a lot of times take it for granted. Uh, this, this team of people that dedicate their uh, Sunday mornings to coming and leading us in worship, but there's also another group of people that oftentimes go overlooked, and none of this on the platform, none of this on this screen, none of this, none of this experience that we're sharing this morning together would happen if it weren't for a group of people behind the scenes that never really get recognized and never really get um, acknowledged, and that's a, that's a group of people that live upstairs up there where it's about 20 degrees hotter than it is down here on the floor, all right? And so I would like for everybody just to acknowledge our audio technicians, our lighting technicians, our audio video people, all of that crew. There's people running cameras. So if you're watching this online at home this morning, those are the people making it happen for you as well. So we are, we are blessed and fortunate. Just want to make sure we take a moment to say thanks for that. With that said, much like the children's department is always looking for volunteers, uh, so is the audio video uh, department, especially when it comes to the uh, live stream stuff that we're, we're, we're working on. You know, I will be the first to admit that that is kind of a, um, uh, that, that sometimes goes on autopilot because we're shorthanded uh, and everything. And so uh, if you have, I would just like to say this little quick advertisement before we get started. Uh, if you have any desire, willingness, knowledge to uh, uh, be a part of making the church happen online uh, and making sure that that method of communication happens uh, in a very effective manner, in a distraction-free manner, let me know or one of us know on the audio video team. We would love to plug you into that, okay? So commercial over. All right, so how many baseball, how many baseball fans do we have in the room today? Show of hands, baseball fans, right, okay. Baseball is a great sport because it's basically just one big metaphor for life. You can just find lots of things that apply out of baseball. And so one of the most entertaining aspects of watching a baseball game is, is, have you ever been watching a game and it's gotten away from somebody, right? Like the game's just gotten away, you know? And so the, the manager has decided, you know, like, we're not using any more arms today. There's no point in this. So he comes into the dugout and he comes to the team and like, he's like, all right, which one of you guys can throw the ball, right? Which one of you guys can, uh, you know, which one of you guys can go out there and eat some innings for us and everything. And then you get to see uh, one of the, I think it's one of the most entertaining aspects of baseball is when um, position players pitch, right? So it's like you, you get, so the manager comes into the dugout, and I only imagine the conversation goes something like this. You're like, okay, guys, we need innings. This game's gotten away from us. Uh, I need somebody to go out there and take the ball. Who can do that? And some guys, you know, like the second baseman or the left fielder, he's like, well, I don't mean to brag, but like sixth grade, I threw five shutout innings, state regional, <laughs> state regional playoff game, and the manager's like, you're hired, good enough, go out there and throw the ball. And so he goes out there on the mound, and he's just hoping that some guy, you know, major league hitter doesn't just crush one 480 feet into the hot dog stand out there, you know, and everything. So that's kind of where we find ourselves this morning, friends, okay? We got position players, we got position players pitching this morning, okay? But, uh, uh, but that's, that's kind of where we are today. But uh, I, th I believe that with God's help, the Holy Spirit will work through this moment that we have here together today. And this is actually one of my favorite uh, passages, one of my favorite books and stories out of the Old Testament, out of the Bible, is this story about Esther. Uh, a lot of times she uh, gets referred to as the girl who would be queen, right? Um, and just so you know, too, I do, I do feel uh, a particular qualification to, uh, to, to bring this message this morning. My family and I uh, traveled to Branson, Missouri over spring break and attended the uh, Sight and Sound Theater where we watched a live action retelling of the story of Esther. So, I mean, there is a level of expertise that comes after having watched this, uh, this play uh, and everything. And so, uh, no, I would actually recommend any of you that have the chance to go to go do that. It's really cool to see that. So here's the book of Esther. All right. We are going to talk about you can't really tell the story and understand the story of Esther without really considering the entire book, because there are 10 chapters in the book of Esther. Esther reads kind of like a novel. It's, it's unique in um, uh, literary, the, the Bible literary history there in that it reads very much like a novel. Um, and so just like any novel, there are a setting, there's a setting, and there are key characters and everything. And so here's what I want to do this morning so that we can understand the book of Esther and then also maybe draw out of it some applications for each of us, okay? So here's what you need to know. The book of Esther is set in a time. If you look in the table of contents of your Bible, it goes Ezra, Nehemiah, 
Esther, right? And so we all have heard that the, the stories and the messages about Nehemiah and how he comes back. The Israelites have been taken away in, uh, to uh, captivity in um, exile by the Babylonian Empire, and they are living scattered amongst the, the Babylonian Empire, okay? And uh, the idea there was we're going to take this group of people that we really don't like and we're going to just scatter them out. And the idea was they will assimilate into the culture that they were going into and eventually there will be no more unique uh, Hebrewness or Israeliteness, right? That was the idea behind the, the captivity, right? That's not exactly what happened, though, okay? But this story of Esther is set during that same time while the Israelites were in exile living in uh, all different regions of that, that, the known world at the time. So uh, this actual story, the specificness of this story is that Esther and her cousin Mordecai, so the Bible tells us that Esther had no parents. We, it it doesn't tell, does not tell us what happened to her parents. It just says that she did not have parents. She was being raised by her cousin, uh, a fellow named Mordecai. They were living in the capital city of the Persian Empire, which was called Susa, about 100 years after Jerusalem excuse me, Jerusalem and Israel was conquered by the Babylonians, okay? So that's kind of a rough period of time of what we're talking about here, kind of happening along those same times of the, the walls being rebuilt and all those things that we've studied about. All right, so four main characters that we need to learn from here today, all right? First one, we'll start with Esther. I mean, the book is named after her. Jewish woman living in exile in Persia. Uh, actually, believe I don't know if you knew this or not. Esther was not her name that her mother gave her. You know, she was an Israelite. She was a Hebrew. She was actually born Hadassah. That was her Hebrew name, right? Uh, Esther was actually her Persian name. Okay, so and it actually means star. Um, raised by her cousin Mordecai. We talked about that. Apparently, she was a looker. Okay, because we're going to find out more about that here in just a little bit. But apparently she was beautiful, all right, and, and we'll, we'll find out more, learn more about why that's significant. She found favor with King Xerxes. Uh, so King Xerxes is one of the other characters that we're going to hear a lot about. Uh, he was the king of all of Persia at the time, lived there in the capital city, and um, not, the, not, the, not the sharpest tool in the shed, honestly, to be running an entire world, an entire government, all right, and everything. He basically, you're going to see as we go through this book, um, none of these characters really are being held up to us in the book of Esther as uh, moral examples of, like, live your life like this. That's not what, especially, we got some guys here like King Xerxes, who actually were quite the opposite. Uh, very few moments in the Bible does it tell us that he was even all that sober, really. Uh, he's kind of a um, a drunken uh, leader, and uh, the Bible talks about that a lot as you read through this. Uh, by the way, before we go any farther, even as, as we try our best to cover this book today, we're not going to get every detail, all right? So I'm going to challenge you today, after we read through this, I hope that after we go through this and learn from this, we're going to watch a little video here that it will explain it much better than I ever could. Uh, I would challenge you, though, I hope that you leave this place with a curiosity about Esther and her story and how God worked in the background of her story, and that you'll go home and study it for yourself, right? I mean, even, even with when we were, we were doing Grace XP there in the, at the end of the spring, right before summer, one of my overall goals for that time was my hope is that those interactions with God's Word spur within each of us a curiosity and a motivation for you to just to jump into God's Word and study it and, and know it more for yourself, right? Just go on a, go on a journey of discovery, right, um, with God's Word. So, just go home and do that. That's your homework for today. I'm going to give it to you right now. So here's the thing about Esther. She goes from being a um, just no-name, good-looking Israelite girl, just living her life there in exile in Persia, to, yes, becoming queen of the entire Persian Empire. And we'll, we'll figure out how that happens here in just a moment. So King Xerxes is the other half of that story. He's the king. So if she's going to become the queen, it's going to have to involve him in some form or fashion. Crazy wealthy. All right, okay, the Bible doesn't go into this specifically, but there are a lot of other historical documents that back up this story and confirm that, like, um, the man had, like, furniture in his palace that was made out of solid, precious metals, like gold couches, silver tables. Like, the guy was crazy wealthy, all right, um, drinks all the time. We talked about that. Prone to fits of anger. Now, he, the reason why Esther gets to become queen is because in one of his drunken fits, he asks for his current wife, the queen. Her name was Vashti, Queen Vashti. He's having this big party. We'll call it a party. 
and the, he's, they're bragging about their wealth, right? I, I've got all of this stuff. That, you know, look at all the, the things that I have control over and all this, this, these things that I have influence over. And he says, you know what? One of the greatest things I have is my wife, Queen Vashti. She is amazing. In fact, somebody bring her out here and get her out here because I want everybody to see Queen Vashti, okay? And so basically what he's wanting to do is bring his wife out and parade her around in front of a bunch of his drunken friends. She wisely says, no, thank you right? She doesn't want to put herself in that position, so she gets some bonus points there for that. But because of her refusal in his drunken rage, he says, fine, you're not the queen anymore. It doesn't tell us what happens to her after that. He just deposes her, is what the Bible tells us, right? So you're no longer queen, right? So, and then he figures out after a few days, he's like, wait a minute, I kind of need a queen, all right? And so that's why we end up with Esther going through this process that we're going to learn more about. Mordecai, so we've got four main characters that I want you to be aware of as we, as, before we watch our video this morning. So we have Esther and King Xerxes. We have Mordecai, who is a Jewish man living in exile, also in Persian city of Susa. Uh, it is Esther's cousin who has basically taken on the responsibilities of raising her. Um, apparently, he has some sort of responsibilities or, or a job that takes him, and he, he's, he's at the king's gate a lot. When you read through the book of Esther, it talks about Mordecai who can be found at the king's gate, or Mordecai returned to the king's gate after this or that and everything. And so he has some sort of a position of um, being involved in the government to some degree, because that's where he's, he's often found. Um, he discovered a plot to assassinate King Xerxes and reports it to Esther. So because he's there at the king's gate a lot, he overhears a couple of the guards who have become disgruntled towards King Xerxes, and they're making a plot to get rid of the guy and anything. And he's like, nope, can't let that happen. That's not good. So he reports it to Esther. Esther goes and shares it with King Xerxes, and the, the assassination plot is um, thwarted, saves the king's life, right? That becomes hugely important later in the story. Um, so then we meet the fourth person that is going to be a key player in the story of Esther and how God's ordaining things and working in the background of this story, okay? And that is a guy named Haman. So if, if Esther reads like a novel and you have your key components, your key uh, characters in the novel, Haman would be what we call the, the main antagonist of the story. Like, so basically, the bad guy, right? Haman's the bad guy. He is described as an Agagite, okay? Haman is an Agagite. Uh, he's a descendant of King, and the reason, I know that's a weird word, Agagite. He's a descendant of King Agag, and you're going to have to think back a little bit to, to remember why that is significant, okay? So King Agag was king of the Amalekites. When Moses was leading the people out of Egypt, and they cross the uh, Red Sea, the Amalekites are the people that um, attack the Israelites almost immediately upon their crossing of the Red Sea, okay? So, uh, then later on in biblical history, when King Saul was in charge right, of the Israelite people, he was told by God through the prophet Samuel, go wipe out the Amalekites. I'm going, to take, I'm going to take vengeance on them for what they did to the Israelite people after they crossed the Red Sea. And so King Saul says, okay, I'll take on that task. But his, his instructions about how to do that were completely annihilate these people. Get rid of all of them because of what they did to the Israelite people. King Saul does not follow instructions well, right? So because King Saul decides to spare King Agag himself and kept a bunch of the great things that the, the Amalekites had instead of getting rid of all of it, okay? Which is actually what ends up with uh, his next visit. King Saul's next visit from um, Samuel is basically, you screwed up, you're not going to be king anymore. Okay, so because of all that. So, but that's who Haman comes from, right? So Haman is a descendant of this king who was supposed to have been killed by King Saul, but it was not. And so I have to imagine that there probably was some sort of this uh, generational resentment uh, from his people towards the Israelites in general, right? Because of they, they attempted to wipe them out, right? So I'm sure this is one of those stories that got handed down from generation to generation to generation. We don't like those people because of what they did, right? So we don't know why. The Bible doesn't explain why. But this, a, or this uh, Haman guy uh, gets elevated by King Xerxes, probably because he too was crazy wealthy, 
but, but King Xerxes brings him in as his right-hand man, okay? So we're also starting to see a little bit of a lack of judgment there on King Xerxes' part, right? So Haman gets elevated to second in command. Um, then he, during one of these moments when King Xerxes' uh, judgment is impaired because he likes his wine uh, a little too much, um, Haman says, you know what? There's a group of people that live here amongst us that aren't loyal to the king, right? And they're a threat, and we really need to get rid of them because they could become a problem later. And he's talking about the Jewish people. And so uh, he tri- basically tricks the king into issuing this order. Yep, get rid of them. Get rid of all these people. Even though, if the king had known, he actually was favorably dip- disposed to the Israelite people. He liked the Israelites and everything. He didn't know who Haman was talking about at this time. But here's the thing. He offers, so Haman... Here's, here's the, how the Bible tells us this guy is crazy rich as well. Offers King Xerxes 10,000 talents of silver to be able to do this. Like, hey, if you'll just make this rule, pass this law. And here's the thing. Persian law was this thing where once the king issues an edict, it cannot be rescinded for any reason. It cannot be changed. Even the king himself cannot change this, this law or this edict. So Haman tricks him and says, hey, if you'll just pass this law, I'll take care of it all for you, and I'll pay you um, 10,000 talents of silver. So I'm like, that sounds like a lot, but how much is that? So I did a little Googling about that. 10,000 talents of silver is the equivalent to modern-day measurement, 375 tons of silver, 375 tons. So I did the math on that, given the current-day value of silver, we're talking like over $280 million, like over a quarter of a billion dollars for this guy to say like, hey, just pass this law so that we can get rid of this group of people, right? So there's something inside of this guy that's like got an axe to grind, right, against the Israelite people, okay? So before we get any further into who, so, so those are the key players, right? So we have Esther and her cousin Mordecai. We have King Xerxes and his uh, not so wisely appointed right-hand man, man Haman. Okay, so here's what I'd like for us to do here before we go any further this morning and look for any applications about what Esther has to teach us. You guys all know that I'm a big fan of the Bible Project stuff, right? We were that's what we used a lot during the Grace XP. Um, They can explain this stuff so much better than I can. All right, and so since we are on limited time, let's let them do it. Okay, so that's what I want to do. I want us to. Do we have the video ready back there? Okay, I got a thumbs up in the back. So. Let's take a few minutes. This is like eight minutes long, so bear with me here. Anything, But it does a great job of illustrating the overall story of Esther that this 10 chapters tells us. But also, I want you to pay attention carefully to like these guys that we read from, the, the authors of the Bible. Yes, they, they wrote these stories in a time that was you know, ancient, but these were smart, smart people that God was using to create the Bible, okay? He was not, we don't actually, I don't know that the Bible even tells us who wrote the book of Esther. I think there's some supposition that maybe it was Mordecai himself, but the Bible really never tells us clearly who wrote this, but man, these are smart, smart people. So watch how this book is structured and how God uses all of this to convey a truth to us this morning. So let's watch together. The book of Esther It's one of the more exciting and curious books in the Bible. The story is set over 100 years after the Babylonian exile of the Israelites from their land. And while some Jews did return to Jerusalem, remember Ezra and Nehemiah, many did not. And so the book of Esther is about a Jewish community living in Susa, the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire. The main characters in this story are two Jews, Mordecai and then his niece Esther. And then there's the king of Persia, who's something of a drunken pushover in this story. And then there's the Persian official Haman, the cunning villain. Now, this is a curious book in the Bible, mainly for the fact that God is never even mentioned, not once, which might strike you as kind of odd. I mean, isn't the Bible about God? But this is a brilliant technique by the author, who's anonymous, by the way. It's an invitation to read this story looking for God's activity, and there are signs of it everywhere. The story is full of very odd, quote, coincidences and ironic reversals, and it all forces you to see God's purpose at work, but behind the scenes. Let's just dive into the story. 
The book opens with the king of Persia throwing two elaborate banquet feasts that last a total of 187 days. And it's all for the grandiose purpose of displaying his greatness and splendor. On the last day of the banquet feast, he's really drunk, and he demands that his wife, Queen Vashti, appear at the party to show off her beauty. She refuses, and so in a drunken rage, the king deposes Vashti and makes the silly decree that all Persian men should now be the masters of their own homes. Then he holds a beauty pageant because he wants to find a new queen. This is like a really bad soap opera. But it's right here that we're introduced to Esther and Mordecai. Esther hides her Jewish identity and enters the beauty pageant pageant and wins. And the king is so obsessed with Esther that he elevates her to become the new queen of Persia. Now after this, and even more serendipitous, is the fact that Mordecai just happens to overhear two royal guards plotting to murder the king. And so he informs Esther, who in turn informs the king, and Mordecai gets credit for saving the king's life. Now, right here from the beginning, God's not mentioned anywhere, but this all seems providentially ordered. What is it that God's up to? You have to keep reading. We're next introduced to Haman, who's not actually a Persian. He's called an Agagite. He's a descendant of the ancient Canaanites. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 15. The king elevates Haman to the highest position in the kingdom, and he demands that everybody kneel before Haman. Well, when Mordecai sees Haman, he refuses to kneel, which of course fills Haman with rage. And when he finds out that Mordecai's Jewish, Haman successfully persuades the king to enact this crazy decree to destroy all of the Jewish people. And to decide the date of the Jews' annihilation, Haman rolls the dice. A die is called pur in Hebrew. Tuck that away for later. Eleven months later, on the 13th of Adar, all the Jews will die. Haman and the king then have a drinking banquet to celebrate their really horrible decision. So the focus now turns to Mordecai and Esther, who are the only hope for the Jewish people. They make a plan that Esther is going to reveal her Jewish identity to the king and ask him to reverse the decree. But approaching the king without a royal request is, according to Persian law, an act worthy of death. So in a key statement, Mordecai, he's confident that even if Esther remains silent, that deliverance for the Jews will arrive from another place. And then Mordecai wonders aloud. He says, who knows? Maybe you've become queen for this very moment. Esther responds with bravery, and she purposes to go to the king with her amazing words, if I perish, I perish. Now, in what unfolds, we watch the ironic reversal of all of Haman's evil plans. So Esther hosts the king and Haman at a first banquet, and she says that she wants to make a special request of both of them at an exclusive banquet the following day. So Haman leaves the banquet totally drunk, and he sees Mordecai in the street. He fumes with anger, and he orders that a tall stake be built so that Mordecai can be impaled upon it in the morning. It seems like things can't get any worse for the Jews and for Mordecai. But all of a sudden, the story pivots. It just so happens that night, the king, he can't sleep. And he has the royal chronicles read to him for good bedtime reading. And he just happens to hear about how Mordecai had saved the king's life. He had totally forgotten. So in the morning, Haman enters to request Mordecai's execution. And the king in that moment orders Haman to honor Mordecai publicly for saving his life. So now Haman has to lead Mordecai around the city on a royal horse, telling everyone to praise him. Now this moment in the story, it's a pivot for the whole book. It begins Haman's downfall and Mordecai's rise to power. Watch how this works. The day after is Esther's second banquet. So the king and Haman arrive and Esther informs the king that first of all, she's Jewish. And second, that Haman has enacted a decree to murder her and to murder Mordecai, who saved his life, and to murder all of the Jews. Now the king's had a lot to drink. So when he hears this news, he goes into yet one more drunken rage, and he orders that Haman be impaled on the very stake he made for Mordecai. It's ironic and a grisly way for Haman to go. Haman's execution, however, doesn't solve the problem of the decree to kill all of the Jews. So the focus now turns to Esther and Mordecai as they make a plan to reverse the decree. They discover that the king can't revoke a decree that he's already made. 
So instead, the king commissions Mordecai to issue a counter decree. On the appointed day that all of the Jews were supposed to be killed, the 13th of Adar, now the Jews are ordered to defend themselves and to destroy any who plotted to kill them. Then Mordecai, Esther, and Jews everywhere hold banquets and feasts to celebrate this new decree, and Mordecai is elevated to a seat beside the king. Eventually, the decreed day comes, and the Jews triumph over their enemies. First, they destroy Haman's family, and then any other Persian officials who had joined in Haman's plot. And then on a second day, they get permission to destroy any who plotted against them throughout the entire kingdom. This results in joy and celebration as the Jews are rescued from annihilation. The story then tells about how Esther and Mordecai established by decree this annual two-day feast of Purim to commemorate their deliverance from destruction. And the name of the feast comes from Haman's dice. Remember, poor him. The book concludes with a short epilogue as Mordecai is elevated to second in command in the kingdom, and we are told now of his royal greatness and splendor as the Jews thrive in exile. Now, step back. Notice how this whole story has been designed. The story was full of moments of ironic reversal, but we can now see the whole story is structured as an ironic reversal right down to the details. So the king's splendor and feasts and decrees are mirrored by Mordecai's splendor and feasts and decrees at the end. Esther and Mordecai, they first saved the king, but now in the end, they save all of the Jews. Then you have Haman's elevation and edicts and banquet that gets reversed by Mordecai's elevation and edict and banquet. And then at the center, you have Esther and Mordecai's planning scenes, and then Esther's two banquets that act as a frame around the greatest moment of reversal in the whole story, Haman's humiliation and Mordecai's exaltation. Beautiful. Another fascinating feature of this book is the moral ambiguity of the characters. There's a lot of drinking and anger and sex and murder, of which Mordecai and Esther are a part. Not to mention their violation of many commands in the Torah, like marrying Gentiles or eating impure foods. And so the story is not putting Mordecai and Esther forward as moral example as if it endorses all of their behavior. But they are put forward as models of trust and hope when things get really bad. And so the book of Esther comes back to that question with which we begin, why God is not mentioned. The message of this book seems to be that when God seems absent, when his people are in exile, when they're unfaithful to the Torah, does this mean that God is done with Israel? Has God abandoned his promises? And the book of Esther says, no. It invites us to see that God can and does work in the real mess and moral ambiguity of human history. And he uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people to accomplish his purposes. And so the book of Esther asks us to be willing to trust God's providence even when we can't see it working. And to hope that no matter how bad things get, God is committed to redeeming his world. And that's what the book of Esther is all about. What an amazing story, right? What an amazing way that 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 story gets structured and put together to teach us some lessons about um, those moments in time when it's not obvious. You know, it, I don't know about you, but it's it was. I, there are moments in my life that I sure would be nice if God would just explain a few things, right? Like, um, you know, this is going to happen, and then this is going. This is this over here is not going to be so fun, but it's going to turn out to. You know, I'm going to use that for something else down the road. And the the truth of the matter is, is that's rarely ever how God chooses to work, much in the story of Esther. So there were things about uh, Esther's experience. I mean, she ends up being queen and saves the day and all is well, but it was, the whole story did not include just easy moments and happiness for Esther. Um, obvious that, that uh, God's hand was orchestrating a means of deliverance for his people. So here's, here's what I, I believe about this book of Esther. God knew that there was going to rise to power in the Persian Empire, a generational enemy of the people of Israel that likely was going to do his best to harm or annihilate or, or remove uh, God's people from the situation. But God is orchestrating a means of deliverance for his people even before we meet Esther or any of that happens, right? Let's look, let's look at a few scriptures, a few passages out of the book here this morning that kind of invite us to see God's work 
behind the, screen, behind the scenes in the book of Esther. So the first one is chapter 2, verses 17 through 18, right? So remember I told you guys earlier that Esther apparently was a looker, right? She obviously was this beautiful woman. And so uh, that is, God uses that. So chapter 2, verses 17 and 18 says, Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women. So you remember the thing he told us about, like, he gets rid of Queen Vashti, and then he's like, oops, kind of need a queen right? So they described it as a beauty pageant. So the king decides to hold a beauty pageant to find the new queen. It actually, that's probably painting it in a little bit of a positive light, okay? Because the way you kind of interpret what's happening here is that none of these, none of these ladies that were brought before the king to consider as a new queen came there voluntarily. They were, the Bible actually says they were brought, where some of the translations say they were gathered together there, right? It, none, of, none of the Bible translations say they came or they willingly, you know, volunteered or anything like that. So the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all of his nobles and officials, and he proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality." And then in chapter 2, if we look on down in, in verse 21 and through 23, this is where Mordecai just happens to be at the right place at the right time to overhear this conversation about these guys are out to get the king, right? So during the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the, the two officials were impaled on poles. That seems to be a theme here in Esther. All right. All this was, rec was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. That's a key thing that will come back to help. God will use that later. Right? That seems like an inconspicuous, why do we need to know that it was recorded in the book of the annals? God has a reason for that, okay? Look at chapter 5, verses uh, 1 through 8. On the third day, Esther put her royal robes on and stood in the inner court. So this is where Esther, um, Esther is accepted after appearing unannounced before the king, okay? And he honors her request. On the third day, Esther puts on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace and in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court... He was pleased with her and held out the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half of the entire kingdom, it will be given to you. Right? So she shows up unannounced, which is, could have caused her to, to die, right? as the, it told us. In the, but instead, God's working. God's working behind the scenes. God allows her to find favor with the king, showing up unannounced. Right, And then, my favorite part of this whole story, we're going to read a few verses here. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. God's working in the background. Right, God's ordering all of these things. This is my favorite part of the whole, the whole book of Esther. That night, the king could not sleep. Anybody ever been there? Yeah? So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers, officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. So there's God working in the background, right? This, this, this seemingly unimportant detail that the, the author gives us just one chapter earlier, that this all got written down. God's going to use that, that little thing, right? So the king asked, what honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? Uh, Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, uh, who's in the court right now? Who's out here? I need to talk to somebody about this, right? Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole that he had set up for him, right? By the way, just so you know, that was... Uh, Haman's wife's idea, 
like, go home and read this story. It's crazy. She's a peach, right? Because she's like, so she comes home. <clears throat> she comes home. He comes home all bent out of shape and upset. Like, this Jew Mordecai refuses to bow to me. And even though I'm the second in command of this whole place, it just rubs me the wrong way that this guy won't bow down to me. And he's supposed to. This is the law. And he won't do it, right? And so she's like, if I were you, I'd just put up a pole and stick him on it. And everything. It's like, it's like that's her advice. That's her advice. So that's, that's, that's who we're dealing with here. That's, that's, more, or that's Haman's wife. So he's going on his way to the court to see the king to be like, he's like, great idea, wifey. So I'm going to go just, I'm going to go talk about that right now. So he goes in there thinking that that's what he's going to get accomplished. The king has said, find me somebody out here. I got to do, I got this needs to be addressed, right? His attendants answered him, Haman's standing in the court right now. Okay. Bring him in here. The king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, Haman, my friend, what should be done for the man that the king delights to honor? What's going through Haman's mind right now? (laughs) He's like, well, let me, I got some ideas. I got some ideas. He says, now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king. For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe that the king has worn and a horse that the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed upon its head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to the one that the king's most noble, one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man that the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Haman is making a plan. He's, he's like, you know, he's like, of course, this is all the things that I would love to do. So then God's working in the background, right? The king says, go at once. Get the robe and the horse and do just what you suggested for Mordecai the Jew that sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything that you have recommended. So <laughs> Haman is like, what, what, what? That's, oh, Who? What are we doing? Why are we like, no, I came in here to talk to you about a pole (laughs) and I wanted to stick Mordecai up on this pole, right? And the king, but the king has issued this decree. Go do all of those things, the robe and the horse and the ring and all the things in the parade. And you know what, Haman? You lead him through the city. You lead him through the city, proclaiming that this is, this is what happens. This is what is done for the man that the king delights to honor. So afterwards, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, back to his job, and Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief. And he told his wife and all of his friends everything that had happened to him. And so now wifey sings a different song, right? Now she's got a different tune. She says, uh, his advisors, Haman's advisors and his wife said to him, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is, a, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. And while they were still talking... The king's servants arrived and hurried Haman over to the second banquet that we just saw about. You know, Esther, Esther requested an, an audience with the king and Haman. First night was a banquet. Second night is the banquet that's about to happen there. Okay, so God is working in the background. There's two primary truths that I want us to pull out of this today as we're looking at this. Uh, there are times when God is orchestrating things in our lives that we sometimes fail to recognize. How many times? I got a few questions for us all to consider, okay? How many times do we cross paths with someone unexpectedly or possibly even repeatedly without considering why? Do we at times attribute uh, intervention in our circumstances as simply fate or good luck or chance? Is there a topic or a theme that keeps coming up repeatedly in your life from all these different sources and all these different places? I believe that what we're seeing here in the book of Esther is God working in the background. This same God that was working in the background of Queen Esther's life and the story about how he was going to to provide a redemption and a salvation and a rescue for his people is the same God that's working in the background of your life and mine. So these things 
that we sometimes attribute to chance or luck or fate is actually shortchanging God working in the background of our lives. It's really just a matter of simply, do I choose to view my circumstances through that lens, right? It's not chance. It's not irony. It's likely God's spirit attempting to get your attention in any way he can. When plans change or the unexpected takes us by surprise or we feel overwhelmed with the circumstances of life, do we fail to ask what bigger purpose might God have in store? I, know, I don't know about you, and I'll speak for myself, but I think this is pretty universal. We tend to view our lives, especially in the day-to-day, from one perspective, and that's ours, right? We tend, we tend to view the, the circumstances that, that happen to us, both the good and the bad, for, from, and, and because we choose to look at it that way, that's why we ask all those questions about why, God, does this have to happen to me? That's probably not the right question. Why, God, does this have to happen to me is probably not what we should be asking. Maybe we should be asking, what purpose, God, do you have in this? I don't understand it now. And sometimes we won't understand it until down the road, right? There's a reason why that, that saying exists about hindsight being 2020, right? We are not told that Esther volunteered for queen duty, right? In fact, the Bible tells us in chapter 2, verse 8, that all of the young women were brought or gathered to uh, the king for his consideration. And it goes on to say, they didn't actually talk about this, uh, in chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, these, these, uh, these women were all gathered up for the king to find a new queen, right? It's, it's not like uh, uh, American Idol or The Masked Singer or any of these other things, Got Talent type things, where like there's a winner and then everybody else goes home. That's not how this worked. Whenever you read this story in the book of Esther, one person was going to be queen. We know that ended up being Esther. The losers did not go home. They became members of the king's harem, right? So their life was forever changed by being drug into this situation because of the, the choices of King Xerxes, okay? So these, these were not situations where it's like, well, what does she have to complain about? She became queen, right? She likely did not view this as a positive thing. She likely did not uh, see this as like, yeah, let me try to be the queen. I want to join the beauty contest. I want to do this thing. In fact, she and Mordecai, there's a dialogue that you can read about in the, in the book of Esther that uh, she and Mordecai are having a dialogue and he's giving her advice on how to survive this deal. Don't tell them you're Jewish. Whatever you do, don't tell them you're Jewish. And so, you know, is it dishonest? Yeah, right? Did God continue to work in the background even through that? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So they didn't get to go home to the, back to their normal lives. Esther likely did not view these developments as a positive experience. So then we get to that sleepless night that King Xerxes had. How many sleepless nights do we have? How many moments of a restless spirit do we experience in which we fail to seek and listen to what God may be trying to communicate to us in those moments? Anybody ever have those sleepless nights? Anybody? I know I do. Yep. Absolutely. Just can't get peace, right? Just can't find relaxation, right? Is it possible for us here we are living our lives in 2023 full of, we live in a more distracted time than any other time in history, right? Is it possible that those sleepless nights are not just, I drank coffee too close to bedtime <laughs> or, or drank soda after supper, which is me. I can't sleep if I do that, right? What if those are the times, that's the only time God can get our attention? What if that's the only time we're not distracted? During that quiet, restless, can't find sleep moments. Maybe that's not just caffeine, right? Maybe that's the Holy Spirit. The days we live in now are characterized by constant entertainment available on demand 
not much unlike the culture that King Xerxes was surrounded by. Right? The Bible tells us at the beginning that the whole story starts with a 180-day feast like, so that he can brag on all the things that he has. They partied for 180 days, right? Sometimes I feel like, you know, they're, they're, so they were distracted, right? They were distracted by all the things and all the stuff and all the, the, the wealth, right? Aren't we? Are we distracted by all the things and all the stuff? We live in a wealthier culture in a wealthier time than any other people that have ever walked the face of the earth. Sometimes I think that works against us when it comes to listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and God working in the background of our circumstances. Is it possible that God's Spirit may have been trying to reach us at the only time when we, we find ourselves not preoccupied, distracted, or busy? Maybe during those moments of restlessness, we need to ask God what he's trying to communicate to us and just be prepared to listen. One of the primary methods for God to communicate to us is through his word, right? We are often, uh, all too often guilty of attempting, this is a lot, I feel like, because we live in this uh, instant gratification culture. I know I'm guilty of this, and I think that universally we all are. I feel like we approach the Bible the same way, right? I feel like sometimes we are uh, guilty of attempting to open our Bibles, read a passage, gain complete understanding of that passage, identify and utilize applications from the passage, all in 20 minutes or less. <laughs> I, I'm, I really don't think that's giving the Bible its full effect over our lives. I really don't, okay? What if for the Bible to have its full impact on shaping who we are as followers of Jesus, it requires us not just to read Scripture, but to meditate on it. Read it. Reread it. Find a question inside the passage and go back through the passage and find the answer to that question, right? Come back a month later and read it again because it'll probably speak to you differently, right? It requires us not just to read it but meditate on it. Reading and rereading and coming back to a passage later to allow the full truth to be made known in light of our circumstances. I feel like uh, there was a quote that I heard one of these guys on the Bible Project say here recently, and it was, maybe instead of us attempting to master the Scriptures, now that, don't misquote me on this, we all should be a student of the Bible, right? We all should be motivated to get to know the Bible intimately on our own, not just what you come in here and hear for 25 minutes on Sunday morning. This is not enough, and it never will be. I don't care if it's me standing here or Trent standing here or whoever is standing in this spot. This is not enough for you to spend time with the Bible. Okay? It has to include. This is great for us to consider these things and to try to learn from these things together. But the Bible will not have its full measure of effectiveness over who you are as a follower of Jesus if this is all you get. Okay? How do I know that? I know it's true for me. Okay? So instead of us attempting to master Scripture... Maybe we should spend enough time with Scripture that it begins to master us. It starts to shape us. It start, instead of telling us what to think, it tells us how to think. Right? If, you, if you approach God's Word simply as a reference book, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, it can serve that purpose. But if you only approach God's Word as a reference book, you're approaching it with a question wanting an answer. And then that's where the interaction stops right? That doesn't teach us. There, there is no book that could be written, even this book that was created over the course of years and years and generations and generations. There, this book cannot possibly give you guidance on every specific, for instance, you will ever face in your life. It's not possible. Can it tell you how to think about those for instances? Yes, it can. Yes, it can, but only if you allow it to have its full effect over who we are as followers of Jesus, okay? So instead of attempting to master the Scriptures, we should attempt to let the, the Scriptures begin to master us, who we are, how we think, okay? So that was, that was the first truth that I wanted to pull out of that, is that God is oftentimes always is working in the background of our circumstances. The second thing that I want to pull out of Esther here this morning 
is that God can do a lot through people who are simply willing to be obedient, right? Esther did not ask for queen duty. Esther did not go into this look, raising her hand saying, hey, let me, I'd like to do this. Esther had moments of displaying obedience that ultimately allowed her to be used by God to rescue his people. These ranged from small things like concealing her identity at the direction of her caregiver, Mordecai, to large, scary decisions like appearing before the king unannounced. It was through Esther's willingness to accept her circumstance and obey what God was asking her to do that he was able to defeat the forces of evil who were conspiring against his people and make a way of deliverance, turning what man meant for evil into good. It was through Esther's obedience that rescue came for her people. It was through Esther's obedience that rescue arrived for her as well. It is through the obedience of each of us that God chooses to complete his work and accomplish his purposes in the world today, right? Could God come and, and do the part the Red Sea again? Could God come in a pillar of fire? Could God come and do all those things that we read about in the Bible? Sure, yep. Does he choose to do that? He chooses to work through those who are obedient to him, right? God wants to work in you and through you, in me and through me, to influence your circle, right? To influence your circle. You know, I don't know who all is in your circle, but you do. Those people that you bounce off of all the time, those, those, are not, those people are not in your circle on accident, those people are not in your circle by chance. It's not fate or luck or those people that you cross paths with. Those people are in your circle. They are in your sphere of influence because God has a purpose for each of us as it relates to those people. For us to be less than obedient to the work of God in us and through us would be to miss the blessing and the satisfaction of knowing that we were able to be a part of his plans. God does not need to use us to accomplish his purposes, but he chooses to. Just as Mordecai indicated to Esther, chapter 4, verse 14, he, you know, Mordecai was a man of faith. You know, he refused to bow to Haman because of his convictions about who was worthy to be bowed to. And he even tells Esther this, For if you remain silent, Esther, if you don't do this, if you don't go speak to the king on behalf of our people, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Who knows that each of us have not come to the position in life that we are in for a specific time, for a specific purpose, for a, a, a way to be used by God in a specific way. I can't stand here this morning and tell you what that is for each of you. I don't even know as know what it is for me, to be honest. <laughs> but if we're willing to listen, acknowledge that God is working in the background of your life and mine. Acknowledge that and be willing to be obedient to what he's asking us to do. That little thought that pops into your brain about, you know, I haven't talked to so-and-so in a while. I should call them. Recognize that as God working in the background. That is not just some passing curiosity that went through your mind. That very well could be the Holy Spirit saying, this person needs to hear from you, right? Each of us are in the positions that we find ourselves in for a reason and a purpose. Ask God and listen. He will let you know what he wants to do in you and through you in such a time as this, all right? I believe that those are two of the primary truths and takeaways that we can learn from the story of Esther and all the amazing things that God did through her willingness to be obedient. So now we have a very exciting moment to share together. This is one of our favorite things that we get to do uh, as a church, as a body of Christ. So as we're talking about being willing to be obedient and consider what God may have for each of us next, our friend Haley Schluter, or Schuler, I'm sorry, Haley Schuler. Haley's here, right, this morning? Haley? Haley's going to be obedient this morning. 
she's decided to take the next steps in her faith journey by being baptized this morning. That's her act of obedience in this moment right now this morning. All right? So let's celebrate with her as Pastor Doug comes to, to take care of her baptism this morning. Haley, come on down. You have someone to read your story for you, kiddo? Excellent. We have a microphone laying right over here on the chair. Step right up on that. Good morning. My name is Haley Schuler. Throughout my life, I was raised attending Salem Grace with my grandma and grandpa. Ever since I was little, my grandparents were always teaching and telling me about the importance of God. Whether it was taking me and my sisters to church every Sunday or reading stories out of the Bible. They've always preached the importance of accepting God and being baptized. Up to this point, I've pushed off being baptized, not because I was unsure or not ready, but because I was nervous of proclaiming my faith in front of hundreds of people. In the past couple of months, Pastor Trent has mentioned the importance of being baptized in a few of his messages. During each one, I felt a compelling feeling come over me. Haley, you want to take that right there? You put that over your nose here in just a moment. Now, Haley... You know what you're doing here today is you're telling the world that you put Jesus Christ in your heart and you're going to live for him. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Haley, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'll take that. Let's just remain the standing. And by the way, I believe our speaker done an excellent job today, don't you? Yeah. Heavenly Father, as we come to this moment of dismissal of this service, let us take home with us today the things that we've heard and put it into our heart and into our lives that we can help build the kingdom of God. Now, Lord, we could be on the very edge of revival. And we just ask that you'd guide and direct with this church. And we ask, Lord, that you'd be with those that are not doing well physically. And I pray that you'd uplift with those that need to touch spiritually. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Shake about 500 hands and you're dismissed. <laughs>